The American Brain Tumor Association is pleased to welcome you back to our webinar series. Our webinar topic today is Survivorship Clinic. Today's webinar is sponsored by Wilmot Cancer Institute. My name is Umbreen Mann, Program Manager here at the ADTA, and I'm delighted to introduce our speaker. Rita Goodman is a licensed social worker and has worked in the oncology field for 13 years. Rita works with neuro-oncology patients and families collaborating with medical and radiation oncologists on a multi-interdisciplinary team in an effort to help the unique needs of patients and families. Thank you for joining us, Rita. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you. I want to first welcome everybody for coming today and attending this uh this presentation and thank you Abreen and the American Brain Tumor Association for re reaching out to me for this much needed discussion on survivorship after a brain tumor. I was once told many years ago that if you learn one thing from a presentation or a lecture that it was a success. So I hope this is a success for all of you today. But if you don't learn anything new, I hope at least that it validates some of your thoughts that you are experiencing and thinking and also helps initiate conversations with your loved ones and with maybe your medical providers that continue to oversee your survivorship. Next. I have nothing to disclose in regards to today's presentation. The objectives for today are general knowledge of brain tumors, survivorship definition, survivorship care plans, neuropalliative care, navigating life after treatment, caregiver support, and telemedicine versus in-person follow-up. So just some general facts in regards to brain tumors. More than 84,000 people will be diagnosed with a primary brain tumor in 2021, and we're almost at the close of 21. And over 700,000 Americans are living with a brain tumor today. So that's a lot of survivors out there. That's a lot of you. But it's also important to know that not that even though you might know somebody else that has the same grade or tumor as yourself, each individual, each of you are unique in regards to your treatment as well as your survivorship. So it's important to remember that as well. There are also more than 120 different types of primary brain and CNS tumors and survival after diagnosis with a primary brain tumor varies significantly by age, geographical location, tumor type, tumor location, and molecular markers. Next. So grade and location of your tumor. Why is it important to know this? Because before your diagnosis, many or most of you probably took your brain for granted. It just worked. It allowed you to accomplish tasks and do things at hand, whether at work or at home or wherever you were. But now changes have occurred in your brain and there's then changes in your behavior and your physical abilities. And you don't necessarily have control over those, either one of those changes. So the grade of your tumor also helps in a way to classify the tumor and will help members of the, your healthcare team communicate more clearly about the tumor, determine treatment options and predict outcome. I feel education about your tumor is very helpful, not only for you, but also so that you can advocate for yourself or your loved one can advocate for you if you are unable to in regards to your survivorship journey. There's also, it's important to keep your medical team informed about all of you, whether you think it's related to your disease or not, the more you keep them informed, the more they know how to help you and treat you, or at least refer you to someone else. Next. There are four classifications of the grade of a brain tumor. Grade one is benign, but you can still have symptoms that impair your quality of life. And grade two, three, and four are malignant tumors. Tumors can remain in the same grade or progress to the next. Next. There are many common brain tumor symptoms, whether it's headaches, memory loss, 
difficulty thinking, speaking, and finding words, confusion, seizures, loss of balance, or weakness on one side of the body. In fact, these common brain tumor sy symptoms are probably what led you to your diagnosis of knowing about it. For some, it might have been a sudden onset of a seizure, which led them to the emergency department and an MRI discovered that you had that the tumor. Or for some, maybe they were at work or in school and they couldn't focus and do the things that they were used to doing. Their work was not up to the standards of what they usually do and others noticed. And that was either brought to your attention or maybe to a loved one's attention. Or maybe for some, it might've been a severe headache that wasn't controlled with Advil and Tylenol, which led them in. It doesn't matter necessarily in regards to what the symptom was, it's what the discovery that occurred is what matters. And know that not everybody experiences the same or all of these symptoms either. Next. So whether it's a frontal, temporal, parietal, occipital, or cerebellar or brainstem tumor, each of these tumors all have their unique symptoms but each survivor, remember, is also unique in regarding their symptoms and how they manage them. So no two people are alike. Next. So again, why do you need to know the grade of your tumor? Because it helps understand the changes that have occurred to you, whether physically, behaviorally, or with your personality. It's also important because then your loved ones can understand that these are things that you can't control and it helps your loved ones know why things are different or the people that are close to you in your inner circle. We're also a very mobile society. We travel and we're out and about in the community. Sometimes we relocate to other states to be closer to family that can care for us. So keeping other medical professionals informed, then they understand to know how to treat you effectively and safely. Also, Life still happens, accidents happen. Hopefully they won't, but maybe we're involved in a, a motor vehicle accident or we have a, an allergic reaction to something which might lead us to urgent care or in the hospital. So it's important to let others know that you have a tumor so that they know this isn't something new in regards to, in regards to what's going on for you. It's important also to have this information with you at all times. Why? Because then, thanks. Why? Because then it allows people to know what's going on and how to affect you. You can get this information through the internet on Amazon. You can order a bracelet that states what type of tumor you have. It can also state a, a loved one's name and contact number so that maybe the medical professionals can then get in touch with you if it's hard for you to communicate what's happening. Next. Location also matters because of the resources that one might need. For some, there's loss of balance. So a walker is needed or maybe grab bars in the bathroom or a medical alert necklace that can be very helpful, not only to the survivor to know that if they have a fall at home and they're alone, that help will be on its way. But it also gives that assurance to our loved ones when somebody is home alone that if something happens, again, that help is on its way. Or maybe it's a referral to a visually impaired center in regards to if you had, had changes with your eyesight or you're experiencing double vision. Cognitive rehab therapy can also be very beneficial. It helps to build on brain strategies involving your memory and executive functioning. And it helps either restore or compensate for those cognitive deficits that you've experienced to try to learn new problem solving skills for yourself. Physical therapy helps in regards to keeping our muscles in, in, in check so that we can be able to maintain as much balance and exercise. Occupational therapy can help in regards to uh, whether it's, it's writing or bathing or brushing our teeth or even eating. And speech therapy not only can help with communication, but for some, it might be needed for swallowing exercises. The medical social worker on your team is very resourceful and knowledgeable in a lot of these resources. 
So it's important to reach out to them so that you have an understanding of what can help you and your loved one. Next. So survivorship. The American Cancer Society uses the term survivor to refer to anyone that's ever been diagnosed with cancer, no matter where they are in their journey. So once someone's diagnosed, they're considered a survivor. American Cancer Society also includes not only, the, not only you, the survivor, but also your loved ones. They state that not only you're, you're diagnosed, but the family is diagnosed because it impacts those that around us that love us and are close to us. Next. But the good thing about you is that you're unique. You can label your survivorship any way you wish. You can say you're a survivor or a warrior or a fighter. Some don't even want to necessarily acknowledge in regards to their diagnosis. So they refer back before their diagnosis that they're the mom or the dad, the son and daughter. They're an individual. But because people are surviving, you are surviving. This has led to the development of what's called survivorship care plans. Next. So in 2012, the American College of Surgeons Commission on Cancer placed a mandate based upon recommendations from the Institute of Medicine that survivorship care be provided by comprehensive cancer centers. Survivorship care plans are an actual document. Many survivors don't realize that they're actually receiving this information or it's actually the survivorship care plan because often it was still provided by the same nurse or provider that we had under the treatment. Next. So what are, what are care plans? They help improve the quality of care of survivors. It's a personalized document in regards to the treatment you received. If you had radiation, the grade of the, the radiation, if you had chemotherapy, what type of chemotherapy regimens you were on, or if you had surgery, was it resected? And then there was a surveillance plan. What is your follow-up care? What is needed? Next. So survivorship care plans also in help include and meet the mo emotional, social, legal, and financial needs of the patient. It can include referrals to specialists and recommendations for a healthy lifestyle. But the problem was, is that survivors still felt alone in regards to their survivorship and they needed more. Next. So in 2020, the survivorship care plans changed and they changed for the better in serving you. It became a team approach and that team included physicians, physician assistants, nurses, social workers, nutritionists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, cognitive behavioral and neuropalliative care. The team members that were identified for each individual was based upon your needs, your, the patient's need, the survivor's needs. And it's the physical and emotional concerns that are unique for everyone. No two people are, are the same. And it also addressed recurrences, which is an important aspect as well in regards to our survivorship. And this should be the goal of every institution. Next. Where I work, you are Medicine Wilmot Cancer, Cancer Institute established the Judy DeMarzo Cancer Survivorship Program in 2012. And it was one, of, one program among the front runners in regards to survivorship care plans. Our program provides patients with a better understanding of the treatment they receive and the care that they might need in the future. It also provided information on programs that can help patients in their new life after treatment. We're fortunate where we have an integrative oncology program and that can entail smoking cessation programs, a wellness and adaptive exercise programs, as well as it offers massage and acupuncture therapies or yoga and cooking classes, meditation. The, the one good thing also with the pandemic is most of these programs are now offered through Zoom. So not only is the survivor that can participate, but the caregiver can receive some benefits from them as well. 
So you should find out from your institution what you guys, what they offer. Also, it, the survivorship care plan explains the possible signs and symptoms of disease recurrence, as well as potential long-term effects of the treatment. And communicating this information to your primary care physician is key because your primary care physician often oversees a lot of your care through follow-up. There's information as well on common questions like nutrition, pain, and mental health, as well as financial issues. And there's direction towards support groups. I can't speak highly enough in regards to support groups, especially if it's a specific group, example, like a brain tumor support group, because I feel we can only give you so much information and your medical team does, but you guys actually become the experts and helping each other out. You guys are the ones that know what's going on at home and how and what can be resourceful and helpful. And you guys give the strength and the encouragement to each other. So check into support groups. You don't necessarily have to speak. You can just be present. Also through the American Brain Tumor Association, they offer peer-to-peer -peer support as well, not only for the survivor, but also for the caregiver. These are great programs to look into. Next. So survivorship after treatment. For many, for, excuse me, for many patients, when they're diagnosed with a brain tumor, it's like a light switch. One day it's normal daily living and the next day that life is switch is flipped and life is turned upside down. And for some it's urgent surgery or surgery within a few days of the tumor. So personal decisions, might feel rushed due to immediate medical needs. So after treatment, post-treatment, whether it's surgery, radiation, and or chemotherapy, that urgency settles down. And it's the time of survivorship that begins. And that's the time where you need to find the balance and be brave and sort out important matters in regards to your survivorship. What happens next? What do you what do you do? What are your loved ones do. And it's also the discussion in regards to mortality. Something that we all think about, it's the elephant in the room when you're diagnosed, but often not addressed. So the balance is tricky. Are you the survivor ready to have that conversation? Can you have that conversation? And it's also important for your significant other and family to be ready to have these conversations. Also know that survivorship is a journey and a process. So it's not something that can be accomplished in one day where you check off everything. It's an ongoing conversations and it's when those hard conversations begin. Next. So some of us find it difficult in regards to how to start these conversations. Maybe we weren't very open before diagnosis and we don't know how to do that. Ask your social worker on your medical team. They can sit down with you. They can sit down with your loved one to begin that conversation. And sometimes that's all that's needed. Or discuss it with your medical team. How do I get started on these conversations? Or if you have close relationship with your primary care physician, or if faith is important to you, maybe it's your priest, rabbi, or minister that can help, or a trusted friend, or palliative care, neuropalliative care. Next. The good thing about these conversations is they end up becoming a gift. They're a gift to you, the survivor, because it allows you to maybe have some control that you feel is an uncontrolled situation. And it's also a gift for the loved ones because they know how to help you and they find out what's important to you. So what are some of these conversations that should be addressed? Advanced directives, this might be called something different in other states, but advanced directives help provide patients the opportunity to guide future healthcare decisions in the event that they're unable to participate in that medical decision. So if an urgent situation arises and they need CPR, do they want CPR? Do they wish to be intubated if, that, if there is a need? Or do they wish to have a feeding tube? These decisions are made not only with you, but should be made with your loved ones and also need to be signed off by a provider. 
but also know that advanced directives can be changed and revoked at any time for any reason. And again, remember, it's a journey, so maybe it might change over time. Healthcare proxy. A healthcare proxy, again, might be called something different in other states, but it's the person that you appoint of a loved one that will be in charge of your medical decisions if you cannot to follow through with what your med medical wishes are. Sometimes we think our healthcare proxy should be the person that's closest to us, our spouse, our significant other, but that might not always be the right person because maybe they'll be too emotional at that time. So maybe it needs to be somebody else, but whoever it is, they need to be informed in regards to what your, your thoughts are in regards to those medical wishes, as well as power of attorney. That needs to be an individual that you can trust in regards to your finances, in regards to wills and estate plannings, bank accounts, and other assets that you have. And then to remember, we're a society that is built on password codes. So much is held in our, our own cell phones, but in order to have access, a lot of us, most of us, have a password code to get into it. So having that information for somebody so that they can get in contact with your attorney, accountant, or even your family and friends to notify them of what's going on. And then the very emotional conversations in regards to funeral planning. What are your wishes? What's important to you? Having these discussions is so beneficial, not only for yourself, but especially for your loved ones. Is religion a factor in regards to your funeral planning? Do you wish to have a memorial service or a celebration of life? Maybe you wish to have your, yourself cremated or you wish to do organ donation or is organ donation even possible depending upon the treatment you received? Or some have the thoughts of maybe donating, donating their body to science for what they went through. So these are conversations that need to be addressed with your loved ones. Next. Legacy planning. Legacy planning can be actually a more a relaxed and enjoyable piece of the hard conversations if you want it to be. I think this quote, which I'm gonna to read to you is pretty important. There are certain things that are fundamental to human fulfillment. The essence of these needs is captured in the phrase to live, to love, to learn, to leave a legacy. The need to live is our physical need for such things as food, clothing, shelter, economical well-being, and health. The need to love is our social need to relate to other people and, the, and to belong and to love and to be loved. And the need to learn is our mental need to develop and to grow. And the need to leave a legacy is our spiritual need to have a sense of meaning, purpose, and personal congruence and contributions. So what is legacy? Legacy is the stories and the information that we wanna leave behind that matter to us, that we wanna leave to our, our spouse or significant other, to our children, parents, extended family and friends, anyone that is important to us. Next. So what are some examples in regards to legacy planning? You can plant a tree or your favorite flowers. That can be your legacy or you can donate time. Sometimes people wish to donate time back to the what has impacted them the most, and maybe it's this disease, or maybe it's money donated to an organization, or sometimes it's sharing those traditions that have been passed down from generation to generation, or a family photo, or writing a letter or a video message. I often encourage, especially young parents that are diagnosed or grandparents, that are close to their grandchildren to do a handprint, a mold of their handprint, because sometime that young child might need the strength of their parent or grandparent, and then they can place their hand in yours in the mold. And sharing family health history is also important, but legacy planning is personal. You can choose to do something or you don't have to do anything at all because we create legacies even without thinking just by taking photos and living our lives and passing down traditions and maybe just even our favorite meals. Our daily living for all of us 
is the legacy that we leave behind and how people remember us. Next. Palliative care. Palliative care, people often think of palliative care as only referring to hospice care, which in one aspect that's true, palliative care does involve hospice. However, palliative care has a second fold to it as well. The other end of palliative care is providing you that additional support in regards to your psychosocial and spiritual needs for you and for your loved ones and what your values and beliefs and cultures are. One of the things that I like the most in regards to where I am, one of the things that palliative care does is they indicate what is the most important thing to you, the survivor. It doesn't have to be related to your disease or not. And then they try to address that so that your, your quality of life improves. And that is an important aspect of palliative care. Next. So the goal of palliative care is to anticipate, prevent, and reduce suffering. It's to promote adaptive coping and to provide the best quality of life for patients and families. Next. So palliative care can begin either at diagnosis or at any part of the journey. I often think palliative care should actually be established sooner in your care, just because they are that extra support that can be provided to you. Neuropalliative care is an emerging field of medicine that's dedicated to improving the quality of care for people living with neurological disorders and their families. So they're more knowledgeable in regards to what's going on for you and how to help you. It's the quality of life that's unique to everyone. Next. Palliative care, as well as, as I indicated in survivorship care plans, discuss in regards to recurrences. And recurrences is that ugly word that nobody wants to discuss, but needs to be addressed. Hopefully it doesn't happen, but at times it does. So maybe finding out information ahead of time can be helpful. Ask your medical team if there's additional treatment options or would a second opinion benefit you? Also, if you're involved with palliative care team, you can ask them what happens next when I no longer have treatment options and when they're not working. Are you guys still part of my support team? And what are the resources out there? Seek out that support through your medical social worker, a psychotherapist, and your personal supports, your loved ones. Don't do it alone. They wanna be with you on this journey, as well as your team, your medical care team. So allow them to be part of that journey with you. Next. So survivorship, the new normal. When that happens, Sometimes we need to figure out what are the resources that are available to us. And talking with your social worker can be, the, can be the starting point of that. For many people, financial hardship happens when they become diagnosed. No longer are maybe are they able to work or they're redu working reduced hours. What happens now because those monthly bills still occur? Maybe do I qualify for a social security disability? What is that? Social security disability means that your provider doesn't see you being able to work for a year or more. It doesn't mean you don't ever have to return to work, but it allows you that, that opportunity. You can look on the social security website in regards to if you would qualify based upon your work credits. That's, a, that's an important aspect. Maybe you're a young adult or a college student and you don't have a lot of work history or a lot of work credits. There's also SSI, which is the alternative to social security disability income. Both are handled on the same application, which can be done online. And there's compassionate allowance through social security. What is that? That's for a certain diagnosis, depending upon what your diagnosis is, allows your disability to be approved within a matter of weeks. The unfortunate part is the income doesn't come any sooner, but at least the approval process has happened. And then health insurance, is that a concern for you now? If it is, 
check with your hospital to see if they have a financial coordinator that can help. Maybe you need to apply for Medicaid now or for other health insurance. Office of the Aging in your home community can be very helpful in regards to knowing the different Medicare plans that are out there. And they don't give it, they can give unbiased information because they're not selling it for anybody. And does the hospital offer any financial assistance programs for outstanding medical bills? Many hospitals do. So learning what those resources are or if there's payment plans, nobody likes to hear that, but at least those might be options. And then if you're continuing with prescription costs, talk with your pharmacist about copay assistance programs and if you qualify. Or does the hospital that you, where you had treatment offer any financial help in regards to lodging, gas, or other personal needs? Or, do those, or does your hospital offer anything at the holidays for financial help, which can be a struggle for many families? Next. Excuse me. Other resources can include local food cupboards if needed are learning out in the community different religious organizations that can offer financial help. I know on the American Brain Tumor Association website, they also list different financial supports that are out there. So if you haven't gone on the website and thoroughly, thoroughly checked it out, check it out because there's good information. Also finding out your supports, your, in and out, your inner and outer circles. Your supports are the people that you already know that wanna be helpful but a lot of times they don't know how to be helpful and they need that direction. So whether maybe it's just spending time with you, driving to appointments, making meals, financial help or gift cards, GoFundMe accounts are very beneficial for some people, but you also should know that those are, that income is taxed and you need to know, is that gonna hurt or help you in the end? Home care. Home care can sometimes be limited for many of our survivors. So it's important to know what is it, what do they offer, how long does it last? Are there private pay agencies that can help with home care if you can afford that? Or sometimes, or many times actually, family and friends or volunteers can do the same job and figuring out who those supports are and who can connect with. And again, cognitive rehab therapy, can help in regards to the memory issues and the cognitive issues that you might be experiencing. Next. Survivorship also has that psychological toll that can occur with depression, anxiety, anger, or grieving what once, what you thought life was going to be that is now taken away, whether that was building a family or retirement plans changed or just regular changes in daily living. So you need to find help. Again, support groups can be a huge help in regards to this. Meeting people that have walked in similar shoes as yourself. A mental health therapist and psych psychiatrist can help with the coping and the changes that have occurred and including your neuro palliative care team and your medical team so that they know how they can be helpful to you and seeking that support from the American Brain Tumor Association. Next. Survivorship, it's also important, if it's safe to do so, to allow the survivor to take back some control. Because when you're going through treatment, there's a loss of control and a loss of independence. And there's that need to have some. So if it's safe, trying to figure out what it is that that can be. Adaptations may be beneficial for both the survivor and the caregiver. And again, using the inner and outer circle of your supports. Establishing new goals and new activities, exercise programs, figuring out what, what you can achieve as new goals, what's reasonable. Relationships also change, which is very difficult. The roles change, maybe social and friend relationships might be different and intimacy is different or there's a loss of intimacy. So forming new relationships through support groups or through people that have common diagnosis and pets, that might sound a little crazy, but just a, a simple pet like a cat or a hamster where there's not requiring a lot of work, 
can still provide a lot of support to you. Next. And caregiving. Caregiving for the new normal as well is a hard topic because caregivers wanna take it all away. No one can do it alone, but they, and no one can do it as, as well as you can. Caregivers often feel feelings of helplessness and they're hurting and grieving and the roles have changed in the household and often additional responsibilities occur. It's no one's fault, it just happens. And caregivers then feel isolated that others don't understand. And that physical, mental, emotional fatigue is high, which can create irritability and frustration. So it's so important to seek out help. And the sooner you do it, the better, because the, then you're more in a routine of asking for that help. It's often the hardest thing to do to ask others for help. But again, others wanna generally be helpful. They'll let you know what they can do. And, it, and that is a good thing. It's also important to let your providers know what's going on or talking about it with your social worker as they might be able to come up with different strategies to be helpful. And again, seeking out support groups or caregiver support groups, which can be very beneficial. You need to accept that help from others. Next. And telehealth. Telehealth, I'm sure, most of you probably have already experienced this with the pandemic and is really much of what we're doing right now. We're communicating through telecommunication technology and video where I can see you and you can see me. Next. So what's important to know about telehealth? The provider can still discuss your history since your last visit, new and worsening symptoms and review medications. The exam can still include reviewing rashes and infections, swelling. They can also access cognition and memory and tension, attention and concentration, and also assess your brain function. It might be limited, but they, uh, they get a good idea. And providers can also share screens in regards to your MRI and lab reports and explain things to you through the telehealth. Next. So the benefits, Sometimes it's a reduced expense and time to travel to appointments. Also, some of you may have mobility issues. So this is a good way of keeping in contact with your providers and taking away the challenges of leaving the home. Others, the geographic barriers are diminished, which is wonderful because loved ones that live across the country can now attend those appointments through Zoom and they can be part of your support team and know more in regards to what's going on for you and asking questions. Sometimes charges are less and other times maybe other specialists or supportive services are recommended and it might be easier to do now through Zoom. Next. But also know that telehealth has limitations. Maybe it's technology barriers, one that happened for me today, I, I couldn't figure out how to do, how to do the next on my, my PowerPoint. So Abreem has helped me out with that. You also need to have a computer or a mobile phone. And also providers can't do that conventional physical exam on you. You need to also prepare for your appointment and test your equipment and connect the device to a power source and know to have your doctor's phone number in case you get disconnected. Next. So this concludes our presentation in regards to survivorship. But you, but to review, you need to learn about your tumor and have that information with you at all times. So in case of emergencies, medical professionals know how to treat you safely. Also, talk to your team in regards to survivorship care plans that are tailored to meet your needs and have those hard discussions with your loved ones, those important matters that are important. And talk with a team. If, they, if you experience a recurrence or before a recurrence were to occur, what are those options? Try to help settle those nerves. I know it's much easier for me to say because I'm not in your shoes, but again, that's the power of support groups and talking to people that are in the similar shoes as yourself. You need to ask for help. You're not alone. 
And if you can't ask for help, have your caregiver ask for that help. Next. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rita. We do have time for questions. As a reminder, if you have a question that you would like to ask, please type and submit it using the Q&A button on the bottom of your uh, screen, and we'll answer questions as time allows. All right, so one of the first questions we have here is regarding um, how some survivors, you know, after treatment, their symptoms may not, or side effects may not be visible. So to others, to their loved ones, they may seem okay, but they're still struggling with maybe cognitive effects, memory issues, uh, and the emotional impact of what they've been through. What advice can you provide for, for patients and survivors who are in that position? How can they communicate how they're feeling with their loved ones? You know, there's some guilt around that too, because sometimes they feel like everyone sees them as normal, they should be back to normal, but they're not. What, what advice can you provide for for people who are in that phase of this experience? Right, that, that's an excellent question. And it and is so true because you don't have a visible injury for others to see what's going on. So how you learn to communicate with your loved one is gonna be personal. You know, whether it's just through body language and facial expression, that is gonna be important. But also for those people that you know, it's as the holidays approach, maybe talking to those other family members that, you know, your, your loved one isn't the same anymore. So having more simple conversations and one step directions on how to answer things is going to be beneficial. I don't know, Barb, do you wish to include anything on that? I was just going to say that educating people about uh, how you really are. You know, I think people assume you're okay when you look okay. And part of it is they just don't have the information. So I think educating friends and family about what's really going on with you, what's good and what the challenges are. I think a lot of it's lack of information. Thank you both for your insight on that. Along the same line, um, we have another question. I think this is also very important for, for patients or survivors who might not have a strong support system, maybe no family, no close friends that they can lean on for support. That isolation is much more difficult for people like that. How can, how can people who don't have a support system create their own support system or find support and resources so they're not feeling so isolated and alone in this difficult experience? Yeah, I, I think that's the power of um, your medical team, your social worker, as well as palliative care, having that extra support through them um, and the power of support groups. Uh, one of the good things I think I might've mentioned is especially if you have that internet capability, you can sit in your home and connect with others in support groups, and then you don't feel so isolated. Um, trying to figure out or developing new relationships even. Um, it, it's hard and, and there's no one quick fix to that, to be honest. I would say support groups locally, but also using um, the online resources um, from the American Brain Tumor Association, um, it's, you know, they have peer-to-peer -peer, uh, connections. I think there's a lot available on the web to help connect with people. I think some brain tumor survivors have blogs, you know, are on TikTok. Um, I think those are all ways at least to get connection and inspiration, even if it's not, you know, in person. Thank you so much for sharing that advice and some of those resources. Uh, the peer mentoring program that, that you mentioned through the ABTA. It is a great service for those who might not have that support system because it is a one-on-one -on -one connection with another patient or another caregiver that is in your shoes. And we do see some uh, mentors and mentees that form lifelong friendships through that. So thank you for, for highlighting that resource. Another question we have is about 
uh, read on your presentation, you talked about some of the hard conversations, the difficult topics to talk about with the patient and the loved one. Do you have any advice on how to approach those difficult conversations, you know, conversations about um, end of life, about hospice, quality of life, how or what advice can you provide just on getting to the point where you are comfortable to bring it up or how to bring it up? Yeah. So um, one of my slides kind of talked about those neutral people that can be helpful in regards to that, because those are really hard conversations to bring up. So maybe it might be that the care provider prompting a phone call to the social worker and saying, hey, we need to talk about advanced care planning or funeral planning or password codes. Um, can we come in and can you just start this conversation? And, and we do that. We do that, you know, often, as well as maybe it's just connecting with, um, I stated, if, you're, if your faith is important, you know, somebody that's close to you or your medical care team or palliative care, they're very helpful in regards to initiating those conversations to kind of take it off you. And then they can kind of give you that homework to say, okay, let's, Let's talk about X, Y, and Z and get back to us. I think sometimes starting the conversation with your loved one by saying, uh, these are some very difficult things to talk about, like just to, to put that right out there and, and to say, uh, but I feel like we need to talk about them. Um, you know, is this a good time? Can we try one topic of it? Um, but I think putting it out there that they are hard conversation in a way at least sets, acknowledges that they are and helps people maybe take a chance to try to talk about them. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question here from a caregiver, someone who's supporting their loved one. How do you keep a loved one in a positive state of mind as the caregiver, as the supporter? What can you do to support your loved one who is in that survivorship phase and is now facing, you know, some late effects, some long-term effects, um, neurological or cognitive effects from their treatments. What can the caregiver do to better support and provide that positivity for their loved one? Yeah, I think um, if there's goals that can still be made for their survivor, that they're attainable and for the survivor then to see that success is helpful. It, and it can be just as simple as, and this might not be simple actually, but, you know, showering once a week, you know, and allowing if the caregiver needs to provide that support in regards to helping them out too. Um, making those goals attainable, I think are really important. And it's also important um, for the caregiver to be patient too, because, we, we need to, we don't necessarily know exactly what they're going through and how their thought process is happening. Um, and to allow that patient, that patience, and to be concrete when you ask questions and, and provide um, tasks at hand. I'm, I'm all, I think it's, uh, can, for a caregiver to feel like it's their quote responsibility to create positivity and help their loved one stay positive is is actually quite a big task. It's you know when none of us can really make anybody else be positive. Um, so I think uh, encouraging the loved one. And as Rita said, setting some attainable goals, you know, either even adaptive exercise, getting, you know, whatever there was their interests were before, if there's any way to adapt any of them. I also think if there's other people, the person who's the patient can talk to either other patients or their old friends, um, things like that. Um, and also to look for simple joys, like, is it nice to watch a favorite show together? Is it nice to have the grandkids over, even if for a shorter time, to offer the person things that might be enjoyable? Um, but I think to, to feel like the loved one must make sure the patient stays positive is 
a, it really is an unreasonable task. We, I think the caregiver also needs to take care of themselves so they can feel some positiveness too. Um, and it's always important to remember that you can have a positive outlook, even if you have days where you feel sad, you know, being positive does not erase feelings of grief or worry. Um, they can exist at the same time. Thank you so much, Barbara. You brought up a very important point there. Um, another question again uh, for the caregivers is asking about responsibilities. Um, you know, as, as some patients may experience some debilitating side effects and aren't able to do as much as they were able to do previously, it may be appropriate for a caregiver to take on some of those responsibilities. But how can a caregiver do that in a way that is still respectful of the patient without making the patient feel like they're incapable or diminishing their own sense of worth and, and abilities? I, it's the elephant in the room, right? Changes have occurred and it's not the patient's fault. And just stating that and, and knowing that these things still need to be addressed and these change of responsibilities need to happen and that you'll still include them, but that you have to take over that ownership of it. That is a very uh, common concern, common question and a challenging one for many people. Um, it's very hard for, if you're the patient to have to accept that you've changed, that you can't do what you used to do. It takes a lot of grieving and a lot of reorient, reorienting your mindset. Um, so uh, kind of back to the previous question too about being positive, you know, I think it's also important for the caregiver and the medical team to assess whether the patient is actually depressed also clinically depressed about all these changes and are, are there things that can be done to help with the depression. Um, I think if a patient can become aware and figure out a way to accept the changes, which is not easily done, I think it's easier for the caregiver and the patient to work as a team to, to, to say, hey, I, I guess you need to do the uh, expenses now. Let me show you where I have the passwords, uh, things like that. Thank you so much for that advice. Another question we have here is recurrence. Um, you know, as we enter the survivorship phase, fear of recurrence can be a common experience. Um, you know, we talk about scanxiety when you have a scan coming up and you start to feel anxious about what the results might be. Do you have any advice on how to better cope with that fear and cope with scanxiety? I think you need to talk about it. I think, you, you know, as the scan date is approaching, whether it's, you know, the week before or two weeks before, just putting it out there on the table. Um, and, you know, also maybe it's that appointment before learning if there are other treatment options, if the scan comes back poor. And if there aren't additional options, then, that's definitely a time to connect with the palliative care team in regards to, you know, what does this mean, you know, as, as things change for me and, and what does this look like and what are my resources are, what are they going to be? Um, it's also trying to enjoy if possible, the simple things in life, you know, um, for us in New York, the leaves are changing, right? So maybe it's a time to just go out for a drive and see the colors um, and to be present or listening to the music that you enjoy. Um, and it, it's hard in regards to that, that stress that occurs, but know that it, it happens. And a lot of times people become a little bit more irritable too as that scan approaches. Um, and that's okay, because we're all human. And it's a roller coaster, all of these emotions. It's, it's such a tough thing, the pre-scan worry. 
you know, I, we have people who are years and years out who still have some pre-scan worry. You know, I don't know if it ever 100% can go away. I think talk self-talk that um, that will handle it. You know, we handled the first time. We'll handle this. Uh, some of our folks like to know what their plan B, C, and D are going to be, even if they don't have to use it for years. Uh, if there's something comforting about knowing, well, we're, this is what we'll do if it shows we need to do something. Um, and then I think what Rita said was really excellent. I think in the days coming up to it, in addition to thinking about it, is trying to keep it in a compartment in one's brain and try to do things that are great, uh, uh, inspiring or just life affirming distractions, um, even watching football, whatever. Um, but I think for everyone to some degree, it's like a universal challenge. Thank you both for sharing that insight and advice. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, this question, Rita, you had mentioned in your presentation about some of the great programs and services available at the survivorship program at Wilmot Cancer Institute. Um, where or who is the right person to contact for, for patients who are looking for similar services in their own institutions and their own treatment centers? Who should they turn to for that kind of information if it isn't already provided to them? Right, um, your social worker. They often are knowledgeable in regards to those resources in your community, whether it's offered at your institution or just out in the community. Um, and the one good thing in regards to, the, at least for, I believe, social work, doesn't matter when you reach out to them. If it's during your treatment, after your treatment, years out, they're available and they're a resource for you. So utilize them. Thank you so much. So that is all the time that we have for questions for today. Thank you again, Rita, for your wonderful presentation. And thank you to today's webinar sponsor, Wilmot Cancer Institute, for their support of this program. Thank you, Abreen. Aside from, um, Aside from our webinar series, the ABTA offers a variety of other program support and services. For more information, visit the ABTA website at abta.org or call the ABTA Caroline at 1-800-886-2282.